Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to you. I think this uh, graveyard session has been uh, very well arranged because this is a topic that all of you will be, you know, not uh, affording to even wink an eye. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the importance of this topic, the goods and services tax, is not lost upon anyone, especially uh, challenging for this sector uh, that you represent. So, without uh, further delay, let me straight away go on to the topic, what are we going to discuss? What are the challenges before uh, the retail industry? To give you a perspective on uh, some of the challenges, and many of them are going to be discussed here with my uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists, but to give you some of the perspectives on GST, I, I mean, all of you by now are the true believers in GST, right? The question is whether it is going to come on 1st of April is paramount in everybody's mind. But the fact that GST is going to be coming next week, is no more a question. So whether it is 1st April, whether it is 1st May, whether it is 1st June, we will not take any calls or bets on that. But it is uh, very true that GST is going to uh, you know, open uh, a lot of can of worms, a lot of challenges for those of you who want to be 100% compliant, take advantage of the opportunity that GST offers. and. Uh, we, you know, uh, ahead of the game in that sense. But few can actually hazard a guess as to how the GST is going to pan out because the first and most important uh, factor, which is the rate of tax, is yet in, you know, discussion stages. So people uh, are saying, okay, my, if the rate of tax is going to be so and so, it will be good. But if it is higher than so and so, and again, this refers from uh, uh, goods to goods. Similarly, there are other challenges as well. There are big challenges on transition issues. Some of the discussions that I have had uh, with people relate to transition issues. So what are we looking for in transition? One thing is sure that the most of you will say that what should I do on 1st of April if the GST is coming is that my invoice should be capable, I, I should be capable of generating an invoice and there should be a business continuity. Rest I will all manage. So, uh, these transition issues are those which are actually going to cause a lot of concern because how do you, uh, you know, uh, transition uh, into the new regime without having uh, adequate knowledge about what actually am I supposed to do to make sure that I am compliant on the first day. Next, uh, again, very, very, very important is uh, the ease of doing business. When you talk about ease of doing business, the ease of compliance with laws or ease of uh, ensuring that the laws are uh, easily complied with is of foremost importance. So is uh, GST, although it's amalgam of various laws, is it easier to comply with? Is it difficult, more difficult to comply with? I think the service industry has been saying, uh, you know, is always uh, uh, saying that it's more difficult to comply with because the, some of the benefits that they have enjoyed, uh, such as centralized registration and only one single tax, are no longer there. But retail industry seems to be divided. So we will hear more from the panelists on that. And lastly, is this law, uh, uh, the, the manner in which the law is coming, manner in which the provisions of law are there, such as valuation, for example, such as some of the intricate issues which they have introduced in the law, are they going to be easy to comply with or are they going to cause a lot of concern uh, to the trade and industry is what I will uh, be asking my panelists. So, uh, sir, without uh, any further, uh, already we are 10 minutes behind schedule and I am sure we will be making up for this time. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask the most important question on the rates. Naveen, since you are sitting at the head of the, uh, uh, our panel, I would ask you, what is, uh, what is it that you have a perspective on the rates? I mean, uh, do you think that there should be a standard rate which will apply across or do you think that there should be some commodities, aggregate commodities for example, or some goods which are currently chargeable to low rates of taxes where you should have merit rate? Hello. So, uh, Personally, I would not like to speculate on the on the rate. It is actually up uh, uh, everywhere, and I don't think we have to wait too far 
uh, you know, or too long uh, before the rates will come out the way government is moving. But uh, particularly, I would say that government uh, will be uh, quite aware of the inflationary impact of uh, GST. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, the uh, Lok Sabha election, which is due in uh, 2019, I would say that government uh, would definitely uh, be wary of uh, you know, any inflationary uh, pressure which might come because of the, uh, of the GST. Now, particularly talking about, uh, the, uh, talking about the essential commodities, I mean, uh, typically Indians spend about 40% of their monthly income on the, on the grocery retail. And out of that, the majority of uh, the uh, spend actually goes towards foods. Now, if you look at the entire spectrum of food, it it actually uh, carries uh, something like very low value-added uh, processed foods, and, and on the other hand, you have the highly value-added, uh, extremely expensive products, gourmet products, uh, as far as the uh, the processed food is concerned. Then you have another category uh, in terms of the fruits and uh, vegetables and maybe food grains. Now, dealing with this one by one, let's say for example, government, I think the intention is very clear. They have kept agriculture out of, uh, you know, the definition of business and therefore most likely the food, fruits and vegetables will be out of the GST, uh, uh, I mean it will carry a nil rate of uh, uh, rate. Now, coming to food grains, there is one issue which I think the food retailers would be uh, particularly you know, would be worried about, would be, let's say for example, if the loose food grains are nil rated, then what will happen to the processed uh, uh, food, where basically a simple process of sorting, simple process of cleaning and then packing into small packs. Uh, no, let's uh, hear on that from, uh, you know, CF of the future. Uh, uh, of course, retail. Dinesh. Because he is having all of those combinations that you talk, talked about. Basically, the government, based on their study actually, what right now the strategy government is working on the three kind of rates. One is the standard merit rate and zero rate. So right now, as of today, industry implication, whatever the representation has come basically to the government, as of today, which are the items, which are the product, which are the exempt from excise duty also, weight also, or specifically in the agricultural commodity, etc., everything, where they are going to keep this as a exempt or zero percent rate. Not exempt, this will be the exempted rate. Or second item, basically, they are going to keep basically on the merit basis, just like our concept, roti, kapra, or makan. So few processed food, which are right now subject to, say, tea. Okay, right now subject to, do the, say, 5% tax rate on the weight. Maybe excise will be the exempt. On those kind of category, basically, certain critical category, they are going to keep on the merit basis. In the balance, all will lie in the, basically, standard rate. That is the expectation of from the industry also. Everybody also now, rate will be around, basically, maybe 18 to 19% or the merit rate will be 12 percent. The idea of government to keep not higher rate other than inflationary, basically the compliance is the merit issue. Based on the government itself, it's steady, basically moment they increase rate by 1 percent, compliance ratio will be come down by 1 percent or this has the tax collection efficiency more than 10 percent on the overall collections. So idea of the implementing GST itself basically to create the large, increase that direct tax base at the every level of the supply chain. But, sir, is it only by the commodities, type of commodities uh, that the rate will be determined, merit rate, lower rate or let me ask this again back, coming, coming back to Naveen, is there going to be a distinction between branded, unbranded, packaged, non-packaged, uh, those kind of issues also? I mean, is that the perspective that the industry carries? See, the processed food industry is actually lobbying with the government on, uh, on you know, on the basis of value add. Meaning if the products are low value added products, then, then they are basically saying that, uh, you know, the rate can be kept at a, at a minimum uh, rate. Uh, processed food industry, in fact, they are saying that, uh, that, you know, don't keep the nil rate. Even if there is a small amount of processing uh, involved, don't keep the nil rate because then a lot of input tax credit will not be available to them and it will help the unorganized sector uh, as well. On the other hand, they are saying that highly value added product can be taxed at the peak rate or standard uh, rate. So one size fits all approach will not work. Uh, that's what is the industry saying and uh, hoping that government uh, will and look sir, into uh, it. branded and branded would like to have any perspectives on that. I mean, is that going to be rate differential between those kind of goods also? 
basically government does not want to create basically but what is the analysis is coming out of right now what is the tax collection basically from branded it is high amount they may levy out to the merit rate or basically on the standard rate there is the concept what it is emerging from the government side actually second basically the rates in respect of the service tax which is right now also 15% now it will increase to say 19% but afterwards they will be start getting basically the input rate in respect of the product where the weight is applicable so overall absolute terms the service cost is not going to increase in terms of the overall service provided by the various service industry that is basically there will be no implication on the service side but product side definitely there will be certain changes in the certain industry it is going to happen very good very good sir and uh, most uh, importantly i mean we look at gst as an opportunity to in, you know improve our economic uh, growth rate no bring down the prices of the products i, I don't know whether uh, that is true for uh, all the industries or not but uh, pass on that benefit of gst to the consumer and the benefit of the uh, benefit to the consumer can only be passed on if your business is appropriately structured if there are no inefficiencies in the business and to that extent whenever we talk about gst the discussion invariably uh, veers towards supply chain are you going to have a supply chain efficiency in built in your uh, procurement in your distribution and for, for that i would like to uh, go to nitin what do you think is the uh, i mean today we have this uh, central sales tax etc which has kind of bias towards a certain type of a supply chain tomorrow when the neutrality is brought in in interstate intrastate procurement do you think uh, the industry players are looking uh, towards reorganizing their supply chain yeah i think uh, after this entry 52 removal uh, from constitution and removal of uh, your entry tax in punjab haryana uh, sorry the purchase tax and even octroi uh, the intention is to bring a one nation single uh, you know market and i think that's slowly and slowly we are going towards it the intention is to create a single market uh, your idea about your question about supply chain i think uh, it's not only from a procurement side i think from uh, end to end value chain every every retailer should look uh, you know how they are procuring what are their uh, immediate suppliers from where they are buying and how they will get credit uh, with the registration norms being very stringent here i think it's important for all the suppliers to get registered your question on interstate procurement and intrastate procurement yes uh, probably uh, some of the suppliers who are uh, now currently at states like for example in apparels we might be buying uh, woolen products from punjab and you know those areas i think now the suppliers have to think of whether uh, they can give us those products in a very shorter lead time you know now the transit time is almost 7 days now with the stall uh, you know and all the entry obstacles going on from logistics perspective i think it's wise for the suppliers to come near to uh, their major uh, customers and think about lead time and hub and spoke model you know where where you can have a one big warehouse at one place and you can you know just supply to different uh, so it's no longer going to be tax engineered supply chain it's going to be efficiency which is going to be the key to it which pratap may I have your perspective on uh, what you think are the supply chain reorientation uh, you know issues that will come up or uh, frankly speaking uh, with the seamless borders coming into the place uh, and and these less uh, restrictions going down to a level which is nil it would be very wise uh, he said rightly the dcs or or the uh, you know stocking place should be near to the customer because it builds up the efficiency one and it reduces the uh, sm cost drastically and and especially with fast april fast fashion april it is all the more important that that you serve the customer at a faster pace than ever before absolutely yes. and and dinesh ji last word from you uh, on the supply chain there have you were uh, in our pre panel discussion you are the most vocal on supply chain uh, you know reengineering solutions etc so uh, definitely would like to ask you what is it that uh, retail industry is actually going to do i mean can you kind of uh, do a cut and raise sir at present basically lot of supply chain is based on the indian taxation structure of the different states say haryana if you do the local purchase you cannot do the stock transfer otherwise entire weight is get reversed 
Okay, suppose you want to supply after this GST implementation, you can move your entire supply chain seamlessly say, from Ariana to Delhi, Ariana to UP. Similar, just like recently in the case of Andhra, Telangana, you need to set up the two supply chain. Otherwise, you cannot move the goods from one state to another state. These are the supply chain tax implications are there. Right now, basically, the, now is the objective of the GST to the easy doing business, seamless movement of the goods. Ultimate objective, basically, how you will be able to reduce your inventory, how you will be able to manage working capital efficiently, how you will be able to reach your basically goods from your vendor manufacturer to basically to your retail store. Uh, what are the, your time to basically market this one? That will be the objective rather than taxation. The objective based on this availability of the stock, how you can fast forward the basically stock availability to your store. That will be the objective on this entire that basis. Entire the supply chain chain management will be managed rather than basically the taxation or other cost parameter. True, but then we are talking only about the domestic procurements. Uh, there are going to be import procurements as well. Uh, you know, people uh, make certain uh, mathematical calculations and say, oh, are the imports going to be cheaper than uh, domestic procurements? Sanjay, you have any perspective on that? For example, uh, 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 garments, for example, carry a lower rate of tax. Now, if they actually going to, are going to attract a higher rate of tax in the GST, then is it going to be more con convenient to procure goods, you know, import goods uh, or domestically procure those goods? Yeah, it's an in interesting question that you asked, Prashant. Um, if, you, if you look at it, a pure mathematical calculation tells you exactly that. That with CVD and basic custom duty subsuming into GST, it will probably become more cheaper to import than it will be to uh, source locally. But I don't think the equation will be that simple and it will not be limited to the mathematical Excel sheets that uh, you know, VCFOs love to work on. I think it'll be a it'll 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 be a toss up between the product that I'm bringing in and the product that the customer wants. See, all said and done, import still has a very very large lag time between manufacturing and the retail shelf, and that lag time involves working capital blockage and also involves a certain loss of opportunity of sale. So I don't think it'll just be a matter of GST coming in at a certain rate and CVD and BCD subsuming into that rate and therefore making imports that much more easier. I think it will be a combination of how much time I need to bring that product to the shelf, what, when does the customer want that uh, product on the shelf, and ultimately is it more business efficient for me to be able to, be, to source it locally, pay GST, maybe a higher rate of GST, but if I'm being able to you know, recover that GST through my pricing, I'd much rather do normal local sourcing rather than go in for imports and therefore lose that time and block of working capital. And there is always in garments especially, there is always that customer preference for the local tastes and choices. Absolutely, so, that, is, that is there. But then the flip side of that is the aspirational customer will also want certain level of uh, imported brands. So it, it, it'll be, it, it won't be a straightforward Excel calculation. I think it is, it's going to be a combination of business, it's going to be a combination of customer demand and pricing. Absolutely. So I said earlier that you know, compliances under the current uh, indirect tax uh, regimes are very complex, they are time consuming, they are costly. Are we going to look at a be better environment in terms of compliances when all these C forms, F forms and all those forms are going to go away? Or are we going to look at a situation where those forms will go away? But more and more entry barriers and entry checks will come in because ultimately remember that the consuming state is the one who is going to give you the credit. So from that perspective, what is it that, uh, you know, what is the view of the industry? Vivek, uh, would you like to answer me? So if we see GST as we are talking about, I think it is a, more than a challenge, it is a business opportunity. And C and F form removal is one of the point. Obviously C, C form removal, because interstate sale, F form, stock transfer will go away. There are a lot of process, cumbersome process, especially the finance fraternity. Actually, it should be a business responsibility, but ultimately finance fraternity follows up for the form. And non-compliance fall to our shoulder. This will go away, by the way. But the point is that if you see GST is subsuming 20 taxes, 20 different legislatures. Now, excise, VAT, service tax, entry tax, octroi, purchase tax, everywhere we file every return, monthly return, monthly assessment, scrutiny, and all this happens. So it is not only C and A form, I think it's a very larger base from the existing scenario. If we migrate to the GST, because what we feel that the compliance number of returns looks to be a large number, but it is the spirit is a completely a technology driven. So uh, uh, garments, for example, carry a lower rate of tax. 
Now, if they actually going to, are going to attract a higher rate of tax in the GST, then is it going to be more con convenient to procure goods, you know, import goods, uh, or domestically procure those goods? Yeah, it's an in interesting question that you asked, Mishan. Um, if you if you look at it, a pure mathematical calculation tells you exactly that. That with CVD and basic custom duty subsuming into GST, it will probably become more cheaper to import than it will be to uh, source locally. But I don't think the equation will be that simple and it will not be limited to the mathematical Excel sheets that uh, you know, we CFOs love to work on. I think it will be, it'll, it'll, it'll be a toss up between the product that I'm bringing in and the product that the customer wants. See, all said and done, import still has a very, very large lag time between manufacturing and the retail shelf. And that lag time involves working capital blockage and also involves a certain loss of opportunity of sale. So I don't think it will just be a matter of GST coming in at a certain rate and CVD and BCD subsuming into that rate and therefore making imports that much more easier. I think it will be a combination of how much time I need to bring that product to the shelf, what, when does the customer want that uh, product on the shelf and ultimately is it more business efficient for me to be able to, be, to source it locally pay GST, maybe a higher rate of GST, but if I'm being able to you know, recover that GST through my pricing, I'd much rather do normal local sourcing rather than go in for imports and therefore lose that time and block a working gap. And there's always in garments <coughs> especially, there is always that customer preference for you know, local tastes and choices. Absolutely, so, that is that is there. But then the flip side of that is the aspirational customer will also want certain level of uh, imported brand. So it, it, it'll be, it, it won't be a straightforward Excel calculation. I think it is, it's going to be a combination of business, it's going to be a combination of customer demand and pricing. Absolutely. So I said earlier that, you know, compliances under the current uh, indirect tax uh, regimes are very complex, they're time consuming, they're costly. Are we going to look at a better environment in terms of compliances when all these C forms, F forms and all those forms are going to go away? Or are we going to look at a situation where those forms will go away, but more and more entry barriers and entry checks will come in because ultimately remember that the consuming state is the one who is going to give you the credit. So from that perspective, what is it that, uh, you know, what is the view of the industry? Vivek uh, would like to answer me. So if you see GST as we are talking about, I think it is a, more than a challenge, it is a business opportunity. And C and F form removal is one of the point. Obviously C, for C form removal, because interstate sale, F form, stock transfer will go away. There are a lot of process, cumbersome process, especially the finance fraternity. Actually it should be a business responsibility, but ultimately finance fraternity follows up for the form. And non-compliance fall to our shoulder. This will go away by the way. But the point is that if you see GST is subsuming 20 taxes. 20 different legislatures. Now, excise, VAT, service tax, entry tax, octroi, purchase tax, everywhere we file every return, monthly return, monthly assessment, scrutiny, and all this happen. So it is not only C and A form, I think it's a very larger base from the existing scenario. If we migrate to the GST, because what we feel that the compliance number of returns looks to be a large number, but it is the spirit is a completely a technology driven. So if we have a proper technology solution, we have a very strong in-house ERP or technology backbone. We see that this will be a very positive repercussions. However, there are a lot of uh, discussion happening on the serial number of invoices, how the invoices will be uploaded, whether the invoice will be uploaded invoice-wise or the SKU-wise. So there are a lot of things that are getting clarified over a period of time. I think it is not too early because government is working faster than industry, I believe. In the next, last one and a half month, our pace they have shown. So we have to also, we are representing to RAI, Retail Association or the Growth Manufacturing or any other CIA, that, that lot of technology clarity on a compliance front is getting clarified over there. So as of now, it looks like the government is also help understanding industry issue. It's not that what is coming in the draft law is being sacrosanct. They are reviewing it and it's, if really industry facing any problem, they are taking a note of Do that. you think the entry of goods into a state would cause additional uh, burden or, uh, I mean, I have seen in Maharashtra, for example, uh, they have, uh, they had this border check post uh, established, some 26 border check posts have been established, but it's not been made compulsory. But the beauty of it is they think it will not stop you at the check post. There, there are, uh, you know, more technological facilities available, including actually physical facilities of scanning, etc. So do you think that is going to be, a, you know, uh, one of the concerns of the industry? As of now, if I go by the spirit of the GST, this should not be the concern. 
the spirit of the GST, the hassle-free movement of the goods, that is why they are talking no a bill, no e-receipts and all. But yes, there could be some, because since the, uh, the duty credit will happen in a destination based, there has to be some document movements. I think industry is working towards that and there are a lot of technology working is happening. That is why talking about triplicate copy of invoices that the, if any consignment is more than 50,000, it has to be carried as a transport receipt. So documentation now, it, what you are talking about at the speed of the implementation, like you know, check post is not there by the name only and that creates, I think it's a far away to go and we have to watch and see that how the situations are converting in reality. No, although there, there is uh, this uh, documentation uh, issues may continue to remain, it may come down, the compliance, and, and I'm glad to see that the industry pursues the compliance as easier than before, but some of the documents, some of the elements in the, uh, in the law are quite onerous. For example, self-supplies, which means your movement of goods from one uh, warehouse to another, are going to be taxed. In that context, within, uh, you know, all those issues around valuation, and uh, issue stuff uh, as, as to what are the thought processes because the law is not clear on how they should be taxed although the valuation rules are there self supplies particularly have not been dealt with to that extent yeah so there are uh, valuation issues so as of now if we see a stock transfer which is uh, from one location to another uh, currently the excise duty gets added if there is a manufactured product if it's a retailer to retailer we don't charge vat on that but I think in the present uh, context, the intent of the government is to have, uh, you know, once you have two registered entities, they want to treat those two registered entities as two different entities. So that's the reason this IGST thing is coming up. Coming back to the valuation part, I think that's a, uh, you know, area where I think the government needs to take uh, not a very rigid stand, I would say. Uh, since it's a revenue neutral transaction, you know, you will get the credit as soon as you transfer that and uh, and, and you know, onward payment, you get the IGST credit as well. So I think from that perspective, IGST uh, government should be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, should relax a bit on the valuation bit. But I think they, they are, uh, as of now, whatever has come in the law is uh, basically the transaction value. So there are ambiguities around it. It's, it needs to be treated. Transaction separately. value, the related party concept will yeah, come so in here. The, so the related party concept, I, I just want to add one more point here from a service perspective also. Now we all sit uh, in our head offices and we have, you know, branches. So we have this HO expenses which is getting, you know, transferred or, you know, the cost gets transferred to, uh, you know, individual branches. Uh, so I, I think that's one area where we should be very careful now because that should also be a kind of stock transfer of services which we have never heard of uh, in the recent past or in the recent, uh, you know, legislation. So yes, I agree with you, that's an that's a, a area where we are closely watching and uh, we'd also see, uh, you know, from our side, a representation goes to the government on the valuation bit. No, the uh, I Prashant, sorry, I, yeah. there's just one more point I'd like to add on and maybe my co-panelists are also aware of this. It's one of the things that has also coming in through GST is the HSN codes. Now, each SKU having an HSN code is, is not just onerous, it's, it's, it's extremely impractical to be able to put an HSN code in every, in, in, on every SKU. I mean, one, one part is running a departmental store, but now just think of when you're running a hypermarket, which we also run, if every SKU has to have an HSN code, that is a huge, huge responsibility and work to be done before we even migrate into GST. So is there a possibility that the government can consider that the codes will be on categories rather than, you know, SKU-wise? Because if you have to attach an HSN code to every SKU, and then generate your POS bills with a corresponding HSN queue which, which matches the HSN queue of what you're selling, it's, it's going to be a nightmare when it comes to internal control and selling controls and counting for those queues. You know, I, I think that is one more thing which we have to keep in mind. Since you have taken up that issue, let me ask Nitin this question that is retail invoices, I mean, they, they are not the ones where the customer is going to take the credit. Now, government seems to have in their uh, law or the rules made concessions for banks, financial institutions. Why not for retail? I mean, is there some thought process? Is there some representation given to say that all these 15 different requirements in an invoice need not be there on a retail invoice? 
So I, I completely agree with Sanjay. I think this is one area where, uh, so as a consumer, you know, when you go to a mall, uh, many times this has come as a complaint as well for us, to us, saying that uh, the brand name is X, we are getting an invoice from Y sometimes. Uh, and, and sometimes you get a handwritten invoice as well. Because, look, uh, what is an invoice for a consumer? If it's an apparel, I keep it for 15, 20 days just to see that if there is nothing wrong in the garment which I have bought, it can be used to return the material if it is found damaged or there's a problem in it. But nowadays, I think the, with, with the GST coming in and, and these rules coming in, I think this is one big pain area and, and I would definitely request Rai to take it up uh, as, as since the consumer is not taking credit, there's no point in you know, being too stringent on that. I understand the intent of the government is to look at the entire value chain, you know, from, uh, you know, if I have to talk about apparel, how the, you know, material started from uh, basic procurement uh, to the fabric stage to apparel and then, you know, finally it is sold to the consumer. So, tracking the entire value chain and what is the impact it had on a consumer from a taxation perspective. You know, you have 26.5, they will definitely going to see, you know, what is the final, uh, you know, hit to the consumer from an inflation perspective also and from a rate perspective also. But just in order to have that and since we all are maintaining different ERPs, maintaining one SKU code from end to end and one HSN would be a big task for us. Very, very rightly so. <coughs> so uh, completely agree on this HSN uh, code uh, conundrum basically. I mean, uh, just interestingly when we were conducting an internal uh, training for uh, our buying buyers and merchandising team, I mean, there were violent reactions. Why, why, you know, you are asking us to actually put HSN. They don't understand HSN. So this is completely a new animal. But more than that, if you look at the um, the intent uh, intention of the government in terms of your GST return, they are asking us to capture three things. One is the GST IN number, uh, then uh, invoice number, and the HSN code. A combination of these three component will be essential for claiming your input tax uh, credit. Now, I believe HSN code somehow the industry will come in terms where they will understand probably set up in their master data category wise and, and be done with that. Capturing of, uh, uh, let's say the GST IN number will come from the vendor master data. Okay. Capturing of invoice number and sometimes the invoice number can run up to a 15 digit number, alphanumeric number. And particularly where you are receiving, you have a decentralized receiving, meaning there are, I mean, in health and glow stores, we are receiving goods directly into our stores. And there is a, uh, you know, a customer CSA or a store manager who is doing the entry uh, for GR GRN. And sometimes he captures four digit, some other person captures six digit. So how are you going to accurately capture the invoice number? In my mind, that would be a bigger concern then, uh, you know, the, the HSN code and... And, and Naveen, yeah. when goods are getting returned, and a lot of us work on an SOR model, you will actually have to quote the invoice number on which the goods have come in, which makes it reasonably far more complicated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is what actually the excise law also says, that it is the vendor's HSN code, which is going to be the you know, of prime importance. So you may have mapped your, you know, masters in a particular manner, Vendor uses a different HSN code. You will have to go back to the drawing board and map your HSN code in that fashion because otherwise you will not be able to take the credit. So that's going to be a huge challenge across the industries. Not only this, is, this question is not necessarily only for retail, across industries. But, but coming back to my question, you know, I'm very, very passionate having dealt with about this classification such as HSN and valuation about methodology for all these stock transfers. So Dineji, you are uh, having, uh, has uh, RA or any other association suggested that there should be a particular methodology which will prevent, let's say, a piling up of working capital requirement for this valuation? This entire stock transfer concept, basically, the entire GST concept, basically stock transfer should be done on basically in the transaction value basis. Right now, basically, everybody is talking what methodology will be coming. GST concept it's, itself is a consumption based. So whatever the state we have, when we are transferring our stock, that should be done reasonably cost plus maybe 10%, 5%, whatever they decide the methodology, that basically the value should be transferred or whatever the subsequently goods sold to the transfer stack, automatically the tax being collected actually. So that the basically pursuit should be done. So entire the valuation part should be done on the basis of the transaction value. 
just like you're talking the related party they brought this concept based on the custom but custom why the concept is there basically taxes taxation jurisdictions are two countries are there undervaluation or valuation can impact the taxation collection in this country or either in that country but moment in the related party in india basically overall even though you sold at say lower price to the your related party or higher price whatever is there final ultimate basically collection will be done by the government maybe the two different state on this basis so entire simplification etc everything this will become more complex subject in respect of the valuation of the so many transaction so right now even though they brought the concept of the free supply suppose you are telling buy one get one free some product you are giving your customer service desk free of this one that is subjected to the gst why there should be concept basically any company whenever they are doing the business they are doing the free distribution it is a part of marketing cost this cost already built up when they are selling the other product in the category so this entire valuation is the very complex right now what they have kept it but if you see internationally this should be the very simple whatever you do if you are not getting any value you should not be paying any tax whatever you do the transaction the perfect was the all the transactions stock transfer valuation including right now we are talking just like free service you are doing lot of activity you are getting lot of things free of service that is also subjected to service tax so this everything basically should be the transaction value or government is not going to lose any revenue even though if they cap the transaction basically entire this stock transfer everything on valuation on the transaction value rather than national value which will be basically empowering more with the government revenue authority where the basically all the legal issue etc everything will be arising absolutely and you know whenever there is a capture of a value addition at every stage of uh, you know sub in a supply chain it is what is generally known as a wash transaction that means if the val val uh, transaction value does not get captured at stage a then it gets captured at stage b and that is why as dinesh is rightly saying internationally valuation is not an issue at all but here we seem to have borrowed the current uh, you know valuation principles in the current law whether they be customs so far as uh, related party uh, transactions are going or excise or current vat also so far as some of the deduction and exclusions are going in that respect i am reminded that promotion schemes or you know uh, discount schemes are feature of your industry now when this is a uh, 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 necessary uh, uh, evil in this industry then how do you deal with uh, such issues uh, pratap you'd like to have uh, some uh, give us some perspective on that what is it that the post sale uh, discounts etc which are excluded from transaction and how are how is the industry gearing up to you know meet these requirements especially when some of the post sale discounts you cannot actually track it through the chain you are not marking it on the invoice as the requirement in the law goes very true see uh, typically indian market you know if you look at the customers they will be very happy to have some discount the common phrase what i am getting out of it even if it is sold at mrp so it, it's a norm in india now if you look at the current scenario it's not even the discounting part we are looking at various promotion activities where we usually give one product free with respect to another product or probably you always give a you know a product which is not uh, your product but a, as a bought out product as, as a freebie now the current understanding uh, given by the government is anything that comes on the invoice whether it is a zero value or a full value product there is a gst applicable now where it is a zero value they want to do a fair pricing of the product now looking at the current scenario i think this would not be fair on the industry it has been taken up with the government also uh, as to you know coming out with some kind of uh, recommendations and and guidelines where this can be managed because a retail industry per se apparel is heavy on discounting you know we have uh, earlier we had you know 30 40 days of discounting twice a year now with, with with so many players jumping into the market and especially the ecom your your average cycle has gone to minimum 45 days and then uh, there is another trend that has cropped in you know there is something called as a silent sale officially you close the sale but you keep the products is, uh, still on discount so i think i think it's it's a very critical aspect uh, for the industry and rai to take it up uh, to tackle this menace because this is a norm and a custom it will not go off immediately the customers habits will not change so somewhere the government will have to give us some kind of you know uh, leniency or benefit uh, in in into manage it better 
So, you have anything to say on these discounts? So, uh, I think at the present law, there are two type of uh, uh, you know clauses which are applicable. So, one is before the sale has been made. So, it says before the sale has been made, the discount should be in the normal course of trade. Secondly, it should be on the face of invoice. So, you know, and and if the uh, discount is after sales then it should be linked to that invoice. So I, I don't know, you know, how, how you are able to link a 50% flat off or a three, uh, you know, one free over three, in, you know, products, how are you going to link it? For, this for me as a mall within, owner… It has come from the excise uh, valuation, uh, you know, uh, methodology. We say that if the factum of discount is known, then the quantum of discount can be dis uh, decided later on you will still get a deduction at the time of clearing from the factory. So this principle has been brought in there, but somebody by mischievously has added that it should be on the sale invoice. That is the, uh, you know, when you, when you merge an excise and a VAT right. law into one, this is what happens. So, so that, that's one part of it. Imagine a case where, um, so for a retailer who is there in my mall, I am giving him one holding, uh, you know, as, as a part of the promotion activity. Now, in those cases, now it's a free of cost transaction for me. Now, I have to value that. I have to value which is, uh, which is I'm selling in an open market, not to a related party. Now, all those promotions, discounts, schemes which we have been offering in the mall uh, to all the retailers, now they will become costly. And, you know, anything which has a cost will add ultimately uh, to the cost of the product later on. So, so there is another yeah. you know, unique feature to your industry and that is sales or returns. So I will stay with you on that. Uh, what is uh, this you know, industry's uh, stance on the sales or return going to be? How are you going to, are you going to change your accounting practices, business practices? How do you propose to deal with it? Because law gives you six months time, right? To yeah. either account it as a sale or not. You are right. So sale or return has been a very, uh, it's, so I, I think two of our panelists might be, uh, you know, might like to add. I think in the current practice, what we normally do is, we take out an invoice, we book the sale, we book the datas, and then at the month end, we reverse it. And based on the collection which we have got from the departmental store, we account for a revenue. So we have big four team here also sitting in. So we have debates on, you know, how the revenue will be recognized as per AS9. Uh, because the title of the goods, at what point of time the title of goods are transferred. Is it there as per contract or not? No, it's not going to be title, it's going to be supply. So yeah. once you make so, yeah. an invoice. <laughs> I'm coming to that. So now when, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the issue comes to the point of supply or the time of supply, the entire GST law is very clear. So we will have challenges. Six months, I'm not sure whether it will be a good time for us to take it as a you know hard close for you know taking those reversals uh, for say so for for you know a pharma product or very strong uh, views on this uh, especially his current accounting uh, practices and whether they are likely to change uh, currently when 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 you raise a tax invoice it's an invoice for for all legal purposes be it uh, VAT be it income tax. Because at the end of the day, if you, if, you, if you start making provisions on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, you may fall into a trap of, you know, service tax and income tax. Because if, if, if they treat it as a consignment sale, then, then the commission accrues and then you have got service tax applicability on that. And the moment service tax comes to the place, then there is a compulsory deduction under TDS. So currently, uh, the process is whatever we uh, invoice, it, it is under tax invoice, and, and the ownership of the goods passes on to the uh, purchaser. And, and rightly so, the same is being treated at our customer's end also. Uh, that is to the best of my knowledge. Now, with GST coming into the play, uh, there is a thing that you, know, you need to take it uh, returns within six months period. Of course, under VAT also, we need to take it under six months. Now, for a fast fashion brand, yes, it's, it's a good period, six months is sufficient enough. However, if you talk about, you know, the core products, something which sells throughout the year, uh, this may not be a very good idea uh, because material may come back after seven months also, eight months also. And, and probably uh, certain brands, uh, they may take the goods after one year also. Yes, so, so Vivek, I mean, would you like to add him here because there may be something to learn from some of the other industries here, right? Because they have 
larger uh, goods on approval basis yeah. or sale or so income? i think uh, what is spoken uh, the six month you know maybe it is a futuristic timeline because we are used to on a certain parameter good discipline but whether the will be right on the very first day because there is every industry because we are talking about this is a supply chain reforms so sor is a very integral part of the supply chain process today so whether six month is the right time or a one year is the right time, it really depends. Like I don't know pharma industry, because there most of the buying happen that six months prior to expiry, you return back. Even in a cosmetics industries also. So especially the, these industries will have a tough time. I believe in the six month time. Otherwise, some of the cases we have to change our accounting practices. We are making some representation. Can this be further extended to maybe 18 months? There are people asking for even for 24 months. Nevertheless, time is never too big or short, but I think the spirit of the law is that why don't you close your account quickly? But business models are not running basis the laws. But however, we have to in the long term have to see that how do we manage within the law and time frame. And this time, you know, is very crucial in another aspect also. And that is for taking input tax credit because the whole success of the implementation of GST is uh, seamless uh, taking of credits. <laughs> And what does the go uh, government uh, do? I mean, they talk about auto-populating uh, the, uh, you know, your credits into your returns, uh, matching of suppliers and uh, uh, customers' invoices, and whole host of new things which we have never, you know, uh, come across, except to a ma small extent uh, when you talk about the J1, J2 in Maharashtra uh, or some such thing. So, uh, Dinesh ji, what is it that, uh, you know, uh, all this, how do you meet the, all these challenges, the vendor rating, for example, uh, and uh, 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 matching of credits, etc. How do you, how, how is the industry gearing up to meet these challenges? So, this is the uh, most important subject for the finance guys, actually. As of today, this account reconciliation, etc., everything. But if it is just successfully implemented in the simplified manner, then our finance department job, at least specifically vendor management, will reduce by 80 to 90 percent. Just like how you manage your bank reconciliation. Nobody is finding any difference of vendor payment, whatever you're making, the electronic transfer, automatic debit. So moment in the month end when the, your GST return is being filed, your vendor, your both are matching, debit and credit note, both are matching, basically then your vendor, customer, whatever you say, number is perfect. Otherwise, salesmen say, no, no, this receivable, customer say, not receivable. So your final basis, basically both are matching, then your absolutely accounts absolutely right. So there will be a lot of issue will be there basically. What right now the government is basically working on the present law, actually the matching at the invoice level or maybe afterwards they may be going the HSM quantity level, etc. everything. They actually law should be simplified. In terms of value matching is there, then government should not raise any demand, etc. everything actually. Just like our right now also, what are the income tax 26 years? Finally, what are the practically government, they should see basically at the value level, if the output input value of the GST and number of the both parties matching, they should not be asking any question for the invoice number. Invoice level number basically lot of the clerical error happens. So goods invoice just like in the warehouse, 10 digit number, he'll be putting 9 digit, he'll be putting some coma, etc. everything. This will never get matched or this silly silly error or where basically say we deal with the 10,000 vendors, we have say 20,000 invoices, each and every invoice you don't know the region, what could be the region. So basically this should be first level basically implementation should be at the value level. Second basically technology is going to be play very much important role. Because you as a vendor you are using say maybe SAP, ERP, but whatever your vendors are using say 20 different applications. So your technology should be versatile enough basically ki how you will be able to capture all your vendor data in the different format and basically you should be able to generate such kind of report from your system or you will be able to upload so matching should be simpler. So most important task basically in the finance department, how you will be able to match it out. Once it is matched out done basically then your role will be very simpler. But initial year there could be challenge. Second most important basically the value matching concept. Now the liability is given to the basically the not to the supplier, receiver of the buyer, the responsibility is there. If your supplier is not paid basically there is GST, 
then I am liable to pay. Why actually if I paid the money, the government responsibility to collect the money from them, them. as of today, say service tax law is there. If this, I got the proper service tax invoice, he has uploaded also maybe GS tender, but if he has not paid the money, etc., everything, the penalize should not be done with the basically the customer. It should be lie with the supplier. They should be able to recover the money. So that is the one big challenge is there. So your master data should be correct. You need to basically blacklist whatever your vendor, if they are not paying on regular basis, then your payment terms, any vendor should be minimum 30 days before he is not uploaded. You should not be paying, etc., everything. Lot of process engineering to need to be done, specifically new vendor registration process, what are the things need to be captured in your serial numbering. So technology, etc., everything going to play very low, specifically on the invoice matching and your credit matching. That's a very critical piece. Very right, oh, but most very important good. part, one thing actually is the one law is there. When you're receiving the advance money also, then subjected to GST. Suppose I received from my customer, I do not know what supply I'm going to give. Suppose gift voucher I'm selling, I say I got the money from advance from gift voucher. I'm supposed to pay actually on the GST on the advance money received from the customer. I do not know whether you'll buy or not buy or in the GST, whatever the returns are there, they know matching concept will be coming. I not bought the goods, I only paid the money of this one. They simply brought this law from service tax when you're receiving the money from service, uh, whatever your customer advance money, then you need to pay the service tax. Similar, this concept has come on the GST. So in that, the matching is not possible. You're not bought, so you're not going to match. You may be matching after, after three months, six months, whenever you get the money. So I'm sure new, new different structure will emerge. I mean, you talked about internal exercises. So is there something done in your organization to ensure a smooth uh, availment of these credits, etc.? No, so, so first thing first, I mean, uh, I think education in this whole thing is very important. As I'm speaking here as a panelist, but I think, uh, I think I'm as good as anybody else as far as GST is concerned. So, so uh, in terms of uh, internal training, whatever is the model GST Act, uh, in whatever shape it is there, uh, we have already started training within the organization. We have also started interacting with the, with the uh, vendors and we have started reaching out uh, to them. Most of our vendors are either FMCG companies or they are distributors. So we are trying to um, you know, meet them. Uh, communication has already started. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we have started sending the product list uh, uh, to capture the HSN code from, from their side. Master data uh, updation has also started. We may be having the TIN number uh, and other things, but this is the time that we should revisit our master data and start updating it. Okay, so 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 these are some exercise exercises which we have already you know uh, kind of begun. I I really appreciate uh, the Dinesh the way he has actually flipped the whole thing in terms of and he actually brought about a very important point that if we get this whole thing right in terms of GST reconciliation, then if not 80 to 90 percent, I would say that 50 percent, 40 percent workload might reduce this whole business of vendor reconciliation. Will, uh, uh, will actually, uh, you know, uh, reduce. I would like to hear, like, you know, this GST is not a finance agenda. Most of the cases, even though I don't know many of the industries are there, people feel what the finance guys are doing in GST. It is actually a complete business agenda. More than a finance transformation, it is a supply chain transformation, it is a, a procurement transformation. So if we want to make this as a successful, Entire organization has to take it as a business agenda, and each and every function, the way finance fraternity is working, similarly the supply chain lead or the uh, procurement team has to jointly work. So that I is. I hope a, uh, that message is yeah. passed, and this is a very important thing. That's not an indirect tax. It's not a finance function. It's not only finance responsibility. Very important. And I like. I, I'd like to stay with you. I mentioned in the beginning that one of the most imp important issues in this GST is going to be on the zero date. It is a transition date, and. I mean, look at the provisions, number of provisions, but essentially they don't capture one basic, uh, you know, that if I'm a retailer and I'm going to purchase goods on an invoice which doesn't show the excise duties or any other duties, taxes that have been paid, and therefore I'm ineligible because I, I was not eligible to take the excise duty credit, I'm ineligible to take the credit in the uh, current, uh, uh, and but I have to pay the GST nevertheless on that. I mean, how, how do you manage to deal with such an issue? So I am hopeful that we get something, because it is really not affordable. If I say that, you know, if I start with 5% output and my liability is in 18% output, from where I will get a 13%. So obviously we are making various representation that we, there's, can we get some team credit? Because whether, if you see like in case of a apparel, for example, if I, key, I have already got a certain bad credit. But can I get some excise credit which I am paying, which I am not getting? 
for service tax. Most of the companies, manufacturing companies, we don't get a service tax, a huge amount of service. Is there some timeline or credit period is being given, like last three months or six months? Otherwise, there will be a huge manufacturing slowdown, what we are discussing. Then nobody will hold inventory. Brother, manufacturing will slow down for the three months. So there, the transition provision is going to be very, very critical because it will build up on the base of this thing. Otherwise, you know, this any, I think none of the industry really work less than three to four months of inventory. And imagine the amount of inventory lying in the marketplaces. So because ultimately nobody is going in the valuation to give from the pockets. So I think there, there has to be a lot of work on the transition provision and we are making a pro uh, representation of the government that some concept of the deemed credit has to be allowed to us so that industry can survive on this. And deemed credit by different types of goods? I mean, if the raw rated goods lower uh, deemed credit? Honestly, the currency is not known. I have given two examples, whether like for my uh, industry. So, do you have any perspectives on how the credit uh, should flow in? No, I, I think this will have to be looked at from a pure balance sheet perspective. I think there will be, I agree with Vivek, there will have to be a sunset period. Because as on, let's say, 31st March, all the all companies will be sitting with a current asset off that set off. And that set off, you obviously will, you will have to have some mechanism of setting them off against the GST liability that will arise in the future. But I think one part which we also need to consider, which will probably also need a sunset period, is that if prices change, right, if, if the tax which, which was earlier a particular skew or a particular category was under 12 to 13 percent, and that rate let us assume has gone to 18 and there is a necessity for price change. How do I make that price change and how long does it take to make that price change? Because remember, the standard weights and measures act is not changing. Right? So here you have one law which was probably made at the time of the dinosaurs and here you have GST. So if you want to be compliant to both, how do you become compliant to both? So what is the sunset period? What is the kind of timelines that the government is giving? So I, I believe, I, I, I strongly believe that the clarity will come forth. And I think Vivek was absolutely right. I think it's, it's going to be, uh, I think it's a necessity for the business for this clarity to come through. Otherwise, there'll be problems. Absolutely. And uh, in order to avoid this problem, I think there is a need for advocacy. I mean, today, a uh, lot of people are expecting clarity. Of course, they have made representations. But is the representation being heard? We have seen the rules. Being you know out on Tuesday evening, we had to go back with uh, recommendations on Thursday morning, and the uh, rules were adopted by the GST Council on Friday. So, is there really uh, uh, is our voice really being heard? Is the question that I think needs to be asked. Uh, you know, we have had a, a wide-ranging discussion on many issues, but one of the issues that always uh, you know in interests. Uh, me is uh, the benefits that are anticipated by uh, different industries. Uh, I mean, there are issues which are very, very peculiar to each of the industry. For example, for your industry, being in trading of goods, you never had a benefit of, let's say, service tax credits, right? Now, service tax on rentals is going to be huge. Advertisement service tax is going to be huge benefit. So, any perspectives anybody would like to give on how? these credits are going to come and are they really going to be benefits? Uh, Dineji, you had a perspective on uh, service tax on rental not being entirely benefit if it is a different yeah, sharing two model. Major right? implication, first your top line is going to reduce since the tax, whatever will be reported will be higher. That would be standard rate. Second, basically all our service tax credit basically on the rental, housekeeping, security, professional, basically other than your electricity or one more is your employee cost, all are and the one is the finance interest cost. All are basically your cost is subjected to service tax, so you will be able to claim the credit. Second, if your agreements are the revenue sharing basis, top line of the revenue will go down, your rental can cost will be. But one negative thing actually still in the right now in the capital goods, which widely expected all your capex incurred by the retail industry will be subjected to credit availability. But right now the capital goods definition, whatever is given actually in this law, there are only certain chapter you will be eligible to claim the credit. So certain item of our capex will not be subjected to credit. So strong representation need to be only certain few exception, say motor vehicle, etc. One or two items should be the part of capital goods, not eligible credit. Otherwise, all should be eligible to credit. One positive thing has come basically on the say deemed export also that concept is there. So whatever your foreign credit credit uh, card, whatever you're getting the money. Okay, right now the state or central government may notify in the notification. So we need to ensure basically how we make the strong representation, just like hotel industry, this, uh, this 
whatever getting this credit of this foreign credit card, it should not subject you to the VAT, and that will be basically give the additional advantage on this front. So entire the value chain basically we should not lose the credit, etc. Everything that is a welcome provision is there, but capital goods still it is a being a challenge. Yeah, uh, you know uh, when when you talk about GST and its impact on the economy, the foremost uh, concern to a consumer is is my price going to reduce? I mean, they talk about GST being good and this and that. Is my price of the goods going to be reduced? And to a consumer, his nearest touch point is the retail industry. So I would like to hear from these doyens of retail industry, what are their perspectives on this price uh, reduction, if any? I mean, is it going to be reality? Is it going to be uh, contingent upon something? What are, what are your perspectives here? So I can answer this question uh, more from the FMCG uh, side, more from personal care and maybe from food uh, uh, industry point of view. I mean, obviously the excise component, which uh, today after SENVAT credit uh, was part of the cost and which was not creditable, it will become now fully creditable. So that one particular component uh, is available uh, for the FMCG uh, manufacturers it remains to be seen how they are going to deal with it, okay, whether they are going to retain it to improve their margins or they are going to pass on to the consumer. Uh, it, it, I mean, only the time uh, will tell. I mean, people say that, I mean, I, I visited Delhi last month and uh, when I spoke about GST, you know, the general public, my friends and relatives said GST means ghana sara tax, meaning a hell lot of tax. But, but actually, if you look at uh, the, 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 uh, the, the present tax structure, I mean, you have 12% of excise duty, 12.5% of excise duty, plus 15% of service tax. That makes it 27.5%. Uh, As compared to that, if the standard rate is going to be 20, 22%, then there is definitely some scope for price reduction. And as I said at, at the beginning also, government, particularly for the next couple of years, will be actually, uh, will be very careful about the, 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 the pricing. So hopefully, eventually the consumers will, will get a benefit. I can only tell that, you know, apparel industry, 5 to 6% paying VAT today. Now you may imagine Awesome. And uh, <laughs> fabric is under a zero percent tax, so it is self-explanatory. Dineshji, yeah, I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Any, any, uh, you know, basically concerning your industry or in general, do you see a price reduction in the retail industry? Basically, price adjustment is going to happen on the certain category of the item. Ultimately, the overall the people spend the money, there will be not much change. Government is idea basically to keep the revenue neutral entire collections basically, but certain industries going to benefit, certain industries going to be increased. So where they basically say excise component is lost, but where say 5%, so minimum merit rate 12% may come. So those price adjustment will happen, which you need to assume this is going to happen in the first three to six months, the entire price will get stabilized. Certain industries, they definitely right now they are paying say FMCG company 12.5%, right now they are paying excise 12.5%, the GS, specifically the weight is there. So definitely going to have the advantage of this. So this price adjustment will be the certain industry is going to happen on this front. But definitely one negative point basically right now, whatever the tax incidence, average is coming as a retail industry, six to seven percent you are paying on the margin front. That is going to be increased basically on this front. But one point thing actually right now, say exempted category of the item basically, your proportionate, whatever you are getting the entire credit, actually that also be certain portion is going to be reverse on the entire, what are the input grade, what you are getting. So there will be certain complexity will be there when you are dealing with a different state, how weight credit, whatever your GST credit will get reverse. But definitely some price adjustment is going to happen on the different industry front. Within your perspectives on that? So uh, I'll just add to what they have said. I think 26 or 27.5 is a state tax, but you, you know we are forgetting there is a cascading effect. At many stages, you don't get credits of you know different service tax, so it is not 27 point; it's much higher than that. So that's one point. Second is uh, a big amount of service tax credit which the retailers were not getting, especially from a mall industry perspective. They'll start getting it. So from a rent revenue perspective, if I if I see their revenue, their rent revenue is roughly 15 percent. And 15% service tax on that, you know, roughly is 2.25 or 3%. So that's a straight benefit uh, which is coming to that. Uh, adding to what Bivek said, I, I completely agree with him. Uh, if the rate of tax 
you know, comes to around 12, you know, more than 12, then I see a 5% increase on MRP. And if I see an increase in MRP, I'll get the revenue share here. So whatever gets reduced from uh, your side, I'll, I'll try to balance that off from the MRP. So I, I feel from a uh, product cost perspective, to answer your question, uh, I see an uh, you know, increase as of now. But over a period of time, uh, with the logistical benefits, with the efficiency coming in the manufacturing units, and with uh, the entire supply chain or the value chain, uh, you know, getting those benefits, I see this is this is a long-term, uh, you know, benefit which will come to us. Wonderful. Especially in a country like India, you know, many many times I go to the forums and they compare this with Malaysia failure. I think we have to see Malaysia is a single country, and then from a demographic perspective, and the tax complexity, India is huge. And and from that perspective, I feel uh, this is this might be one-time pain for the entire industry as a country. But I see for a long term, this will definitely be beneficial. Sure. Pratap, you have been wanting to say something. I think most of it is covered. Uh, just one bit per point. See, in India, uh, the MRP concept is still in vogue. And I expect it will continue for various reasons. Under the Legal Metrology Act, it will continue. Yes, but, but then please understand, uh, being a democratic setup and not a capitalistic one, the government still wants to have some kind of say in the pricing procedure of uh, various industries. So the MRP is, uh, is to be here for a long, long time. Now, uh, as the panelist uh, said, uh, next one and a half to a year's time, you will not find any decrease in the cost. It may go up a bit because nobody wants to you know, absorb that kind of loss because the rate difference for the Apple industry is too huge to be absorbed. But yes, over a period of say two years time, when uh, the efficiency uh, between you know uh, Indian manufacturers versus the import goods stabilizes. Then definitely uh, the the thing that you need to give a customer is the product, and and, and at a uh, value pricing and and not at a luxury pricing because then the customer if if it does not find value in the product he will start to you know cancel the buying. So you have the last word. Oh, we've got only five minutes left, well, so keep my answer very sweet, no. No prices will come down. No prices will come down. But then internationally it has been seen that whenever a new reform of this nature has been introduced, for a period of time people become conservative and by the time they actually readjust their supply chain, their pricing strategies, etc., there is a gap of time when, when there is an inflationary tendency. So hopefully the rate of tax will determine all of this and it will be uh, pegged at such a level that hopefully we will see, a, you know, a, if not a price reduction, Sanjay, at least the maintenance of price at the same level for some period of time. Now we have five, ten minutes left uh, for uh, questions and answers from the audience. So uh, my panelists are here, I am here. If there are any questions, please feel free to add. And, and please uh, mention uh, your name and also please mention your industry. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Aslam here from the durable industry. Uh, the history shows that the uh, countries that have adopted uh, GST, uh, the reigning party has lost the, the subsequent election. So the question to you is, uh, is this the right time for the current government to go for GST? Is this a question that anybody, uh, any one of us wants to answer here? <laughs> I thought post lunch that's a good question to ask. <laughs> No, I think uh, which is the reason uh, why uh, they are in a hurry, not nearer the election date, but in a hurry to implement the GST. That could be one reason. Don't want to delay it too near the election date, right? Oh, we answer them three years later. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I'd like to know from, from that perspective, because there's so much happening uh, in terms of changes. How will this affect? Vivek, you want to take that? Uh, not a single country where this rule has been broken. It's almost, you know, in line. We are also in the same board, the VA, because I think we are also discussing the same thing. What we only see that, uh, let's leave aside the government part, let's see we as a business fraternity. What we see last three, four months, the pace of the speed, while the work is happening from the last couple of years, one year, very seriously. So if you go by the spirit and the commitment of every department, whether it is in GST and network work, whether the consultancy work, whether the, our seriousness is really coming to a true business. What happened to the government, whosoever comes, does not matter. But I think this is a national reform. And as Sanjay has talked about, it could be a, some anticipatory inflation for a short time. But long term, the GST is going to be a very fruitful measure for us. 
right, time is never right and wrong. I think when you start, it is the beginning of the journey. So let's finger cross and look for the best. Am I allowed a second question? Yes, sure. Okay. Just a quick one. Uh, what also came out from your discussions and whatever reading we've done so far on public domain, the GST that India is implementing is not really the international GST. It's highly customized. Uh, do you think that's the right, the right way to go? So I, I will take this question. You are right because it is a Indian federalism. If you see the democratic country structure, globally, basically, whenever GST has been implemented, there are two to three rates, basically. Basically, one is exempted rate, another is a precious metal rate, and another is a standard rate. But considering the Indian federal st structure, and there is anticipated there will be four or five type of rates. One is obviously exemption rate, another would be metal rate. Then we are talking about lower rate, standard rate, and demerit rate. We have to believe that India is different from any other country in the world because of the federal structure and the sovereignty of the country. I think this is, the, I think, the best what could be possible. Yeah, also, this kind of a structure has never been attempted, especially the GST and is a unique feature to only to India and the world is watching us, whether how successfully we are. You have heard of carousel fraud in the, uh, in the EU and uh, various uh, countries have faced uh, this uh, disappearing trader uh, issues. So this uh, structure of the GST and is hopefully going to mitigate uh, such issues. I'll just uh, add to... Uh, uh, what Vivek said. So essentially, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, this whole federal structure of uh, center versus state actually is being enshrined in the constitution. And that was, you know, uh, was basically, uh, is something like sacrosanct, where, where basically center has given the, uh, uh, you know, the enough assurance to the, to the, uh, to the federal uh, state government that their uh, autonomy, uh, their economic, uh, uh, basically autonomy will be ensured. So, and looking at the complex structure uh, in India, uh, Canada is the only country where they have this dual um, uh, GST rate. Uh, I think I think government has come out with a with a pretty decent structure of SGST, CGST, and IGST, where SGST component will go to the state straight away, CGST will go to center, IGST will obviously be again will be split between SGST and CGST, and and accordingly it will be shared. And whatever comes to the center kitty will again it will be distributed. So. So I think, I think that structure is pretty good given the complexity and uh, the, the boundaries which constitution has actually set. So uh, we have uh, I mean, uh, time constraint here and uh, I would like to you know, thank all the panelists for you know, involved discussion not only in the panel but even in the pre-panel discussions. I mean we have such involved discussions. I mean you would rarely see the panelists uh, so involved with the subject. And I'm sure the pin drop silence and your participation and I could see three, four hands going up uh, wanting to ask questions. Which means that this is a subject which is very important to us, very close to our hearts and it's going to determine the success of uh, many of our organizations uh, in the near future to come. Uh, so with uh, all due humility, uh, you know, I would like to uh, close this session and uh, wish everyone a speedy GST. A speedy recovery to GST. Thank you.